Today I'm shooting from Ojai, California at the farm of Max Becker First Steps Farm. In this video, you're gonna see how to start a farm off-grid and what lessons Max has learned starting up a farm over the last four years. There's a lot coming, stay tuned for it in this video. Max's farm here in Ojai is a little over an acre in size, and he's modeled this farm after Jean Martin, taking a lot of the techniques that JM talks about in his book, The Market Gardener, and really applying them in this Southern California context. One thing that's really unique about Max's farm here is it's off grid. There's no power coming onto property here. The only power on property is generated on site via a gasoline generator, and they also have a bank of solar panels which feeds a battery bank which they use for part of their greenhouse. So there's no power of any sort here and that brings its own set of challenges which you're gonna hear about in this video. Max is also leased an acre. He doesn't own this land. So he leases the land at a pretty favorable rate, about $150 a month, including water. Pretty good deal. But along the way over the last four years, he's learned some lessons in startup like planting out too much, how to control weeds, how to, what crops to grow, what crops not to grow. Today I'm gonna to take a tour around this farm and you're gonna see some of the ins and outs. This is a property you're leasing. Why lease and how has the lease worked out for you? Uh, well, the why is simply we had no other choice. Um, you know, to buy land here in Southern California uh, costs a lot of money. And we came into this with no money and some student debt. <laughs> so buying was not even an option for us. Uh, you know, Joel Soliton encourages young farmers to lease instead of buy because it provides you with flexibility. And you know, we have total flexibility here. We have a month to month lease. We could um, find something better next month, pack up and be out of here. And it's not quite that simple because you've been soil building and you know, you gotta, it would be a hassle to move, but it would be possible. Whereas if, if you bought a place, it's a lot harder to, to just get up and move. When you got a month to month lease, how do you balance the improvements you do just even to the soil itself with knowing that it could be temporary? Is it just something you just have to commit to it regardless of whether you're here for three months or three years? Yeah, well, there's a balance. I mean, to a certain extent, we just have to swallow the fact that we're gonna have to walk away from all this soil building. And I mean, we have literally bought in thousands of dollars of soil amendments from compost to the microgreen soil that we then you know, funnel through the beds to fertilizers. I mean, thousands of dollars have gone into the soil. We broad fork it, we don't use a rototiller. I mean, we treat the soil as if it were our own. And part of that is simply mission driven. You know, we believe in making God's green earth a greener place. And we're, we would be sad if we left behind a place in worse quality than we found it. So we're on a soil building mission. We feel very good about doing that. We also know that we're building soil building skills for ourselves so that when we do end up on our own place someday, we've been building soils for the last 20 years instead of depleting them and we know exactly how to do that. Um, there is also some short-term benefit. I mean, you put compost down on a bed and you see the results immediately. You know, out here we have a pretty nice balance between, you know, sandy and clay soil, but you know, when you put sand and clay and water together, <laughs> they form a brick and having the organic matter in there really makes the difference between a pliable bed and one that isn't. So even as soon as you spread it, you notice you know, positive results as well as long-term soil building over time. Here's an example of one of Max's production beds right here based on JM's model, but it looks very different than you might see if you went to JM's La Grelinette or Catamps up in Quebec. I mean, this biome is totally different. We're in the Ojai Valley, majestic mountains across the way, and it is bone dry. We probably haven't had rain here since maybe April, and it's now mid-October. It's very dry. They're on a limited water situation up here, and there's a lot of brown. So if you want to water or if you want to grow stuff out here, there's going to be a lot of water watering in play. And just keep that in mind as you see different shots around the farm today, water is one limiting factor in terms of how well you can grow. Here's an example of the micro sprinkler irrigation system Max is using on these beds. One issue with it is it puts out fine droplets. We're in a windy valley, that water can blow. It's blowing on me right here, but it would cover four beds. So one of the nuances of farming in this biome. Here's the timer system Max uses to irrigate these beds, and it's a unique setup. He was having some issues with carrots germinating, thought it was too dry, so now he has a two timer setup. Basically you have two timers running to one line. This timer will put a line on for three hours at a time, 
that runs once every 24 hours. And this runs for 30 minutes every... Six hours. Every 30 minutes every six hours. So you're able to get two different cycles through the same exact drip line with two timers that just go into a T, one way to kind of stack functions, stack technology, and really get more out of the functions that a timer has by using two of them. The whole idea with having the half hour on every six hours is just to keep the soil moist, keep it from crusting over, especially on new direct seeded crops. If you're tending to have bad germination, one thing I hear from a lot of farmers, just hearing it from Max, is probably lack of water. What are some of the challenges of having this farm off grid, no power on site? Well, the biggest challenge is the greenhouse. Um, you know, the sprinklers run on a little battery powered timer, so that's not a problem. Uh, you know, we have a generator for running the washing machine, which we use for spinning greens. We only run that 20 to 30 minutes a week, so you know, not a big deal there. But it's the greenhouse where it really hits us hard because you need fans going in there. Uh, it'd be nice to have, you know, bottom heating on some of the seedlings. Uh, you know, almost every greenhouse device uses electricity. and you know, that's something which until recently we've had to live without. Um, now we have a small solar setup with a battery bank which runs our swamp cooler which can also function as a fan. Uh, but we, we suffered before that. I mean we used shade cloth, we rolled up the sides for ventilation, but even with that there's a lot of heat that built up in there. What do you do for your post-harvest cooling? No power, how do you keep the produce cool because you know, it's not like the ambient air temperature is that cool up here. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, in the heat of the summer, we buy ice. We buy ice at the grocery store, we ice the water, and the greens go into ice-chilled water. And the water's not even that cold because, um, you know, when it's 110 degrees in the day and only cools off to, you know, maybe 70-something at night, you know, the water that comes out of the hose is not that cool. So the ice brings it down to a temperature where at least it cools the greens somewhat, and we have definitely noticed that greens, which we don't wash, don't last as long as the ones that we do wash because that cool water is pulling the field heat out of them. So we use the ice and then uh, it's tricky because we have a CoolBot trailer, which is a great walk-in cooler, but we don't have it here. It's at our house five minutes away. So um, earlier today they harvested some micro radish and uh, Nicole ran them straight home and then came back and you know, had to take 15 minutes to do that. Could you tow it here? We could tow it and we've considered that. For the time being it seems easier just to leave it parked in our driveway, not to have to hitch it up to the truck, back and forth, run it off the generator. We'd have to use our generator a lot more because uh, the the solar setup doesn't quite have the the power to, to run the compressor on the AC unit. But no that, that is an option. We could we could tow it out here. Um, up until now it seemed easiest just to, to run it home and leave the cooler in the driveway plugged in. A couple unique challenges that Max faces out here that might not be so unique at all. I mean, one, he doesn't live on this farm. His farm is about two and a half miles off here. It's five minutes away, so you gotta drive back and forth. Not that far, but still not as easy as walking out your back door. The other thing is he's running this farm with his wife one helper and he has two young kids, a four year old and one that's just under two years old. Challenging in and of itself. I know I have three kids, but they're making it work. They're making a go of it. And when you're just starting out, although he's been doing this for four years, when you're early on in your career, you gotta take what you can get. Land isn't super cheap up here in Ohio. This was a lease that made sense for them. So they got it. It's not their backyard, but they're making it work. And they're not just two single 20 somethings, putting 80 hours a week into this farm. They're having the constraint of having to do this while raising two kids who are walking around the farm, trying to keep them out of beds, trying to keep them safe and enjoying it in the process. That's one thing I always try and tell people is don't forget why you do this in the first place. It's a lifestyle. And a lot of times people leave one field, like a corporate field to get into this field. Don't just recreate that corporate atmosphere on your farm. Make sure you're enjoying it in the process as well. A lot of times having your kids around makes it easier to enjoy. Here, Max, we're standing in front of your solar setup. When did you put it in? Why did you put it in? And what is it actually doing? Uh, we put it in just three or four months ago, you know, as the summer began to get really hot. And the main thing we put it in for was the swamp cooler in the greenhouse. Um, when it's 110 outside, it's even hotter inside the greenhouse. Uh, even with shade cloth, you can only keep the greenhouse so cool. And the swamp cooler we bought um, is a uh, 
we, we got it on Amazon for four hundred dollars, and it takes the temperature down. I'd say fifteen to twenty degrees in there. And what about these panels? What's the sizing on these, and how many batteries do you have running off of them? Uh, we've got eight batteries, so they're they're twelve twelve volt panels, which are all linked in series, making a forty eight volt system. And then the batteries are six volt batteries, eight of them, once again linked in series to make a, a, a forty eight volt battery bank. And then there's a there's a charge controller hooked up, which just shuts the uh, power supply off from the panels to the batteries once they're loaded. And uh, there's an inverter, uh, which lets uh, us you know, plug directly from the you know, a normal plug into a, into an outlet. And this has no problem power in the swamp cooler. No, we've had more than sufficient power to run the swamp cooler on, on the hottest of days. I'm only running it from about you know the earliest I would turn it on would be 10 in the morning, shutting it off at four or five. And those are generally sunny hours. You know, hot days are sunny days, so you get tons of power, and the batteries are pretty much being replenished as the swamp cooler draws from them. Now we're standing inside your greenhouse. It's toasty in here right now. It's not even the middle of summer. And here's the inside view of the swamp cooler here. You've just cut a hole in the panel. Swamp cooler is backed up to here. Now this not only is just bringing cool air in, but there's a purpose of why it's on the outside, right? That's right, yeah. Um, the way evaporative cooling works is uh, you take hot, dry air, you run it through a medium that's wet, and um, the, the, the heat and dryness of the air evaporates the water, having a cooling effect on the air as it comes through. So if you had the swamp cooler inside, which we did in the beginning, um, after a while the air begins to cool in here and it gets humid, and so the air being sucked into the swamp cooler is cooler humid air, which does not have the same cooling effect. Uh, by putting it outside, we're drawing in completely new air from the outside all the time, very hot, very dry, because we, we have a dry climate here, especially in the summer, and we get the maximum cooling effect coming in. How important is that to your microgreen production? Like without it, you know, you're saying you're facing challenges before with things like trying to use shade cloth to cool it down. You can't run a bunch of fans to, you know, pump the hot air out of here because you are off grid. So this is the solution. But just from a microgreen's growing standpoint, how important is that cooler temperature? Uh, it, it's really essential. I mean, when you're talking over 100 degrees, um, I mean, we did it two summers ago. We did grow some days um, and we kept the crop alive, but you know, it's it's just that. It's a matter of keeping the crop alive. If the crop does not thrive at temperatures that high. You know, ideally, you'd be keeping it in a range of you know 60 to 80 degrees, somewhere in there. Uh, you know, 60 at night, maybe 80 in the day. Um, you know, very few plants thrive in that kind of heat. What about on the flip side, in the middle of winter, it gets chilly up here if you want to grow microgreens. Can that solar grid that you have power a heater? Uh, absolutely, and there's a couple options we looked into there. One is a propane only heater, which would actually take no power, which would be nice because you know, we could have several cloudy days in a row in the winter, in which case the batteries might get depleted, and if we're depending on that for our power, that might let us down on a cold night. So. Uh, we, have, we have to make a decision before this winter whether to do a propane only heater or to use a heater we already own, which uses forced air heating, uh, which would draw power from the, from the panels and batteries in order to power the fan on that heater. One of the main drivers out here in terms of product for Max off his farm, just like most farms in this space, when you're small scale, high dollar value per square foot, it's salad greens. He's growing a lot of salad greens here. He has some tomatoes. One interesting thing about his business is he has two main market streams, his web store slash CSA and his farmer's market. For his web store and his CSA, he can aggregate products from other farmers. But for his farmer's market, he can only sell what he grows on his farm. So what he tends to grow on this farm is mostly what he sells at the farmer's market because if he grows it, he can get full margin for it by selling it at the farmer's market. If he's gonna put it into the CSA, he's gotta give a little bit of a discount on price and he's aggregating from other farmers so the margin's smaller. So his highest margin stuff tends to come off this farm which he sells at the farmer's market. Everything he aggregates and surplus from this farm can go into the CSA. So it's a nice balance of the business streams where the CSA, the farm store, can soak up extra production here but his first line of main margin, if you will, the highest profitability is going to the farmer's market. But you can only grow that so big, and that's why he has the farm store, which allows him to reach another customer base that might not normally shop at a farmer's market. You have a little over an acre here. How was that starting out? Too big, too small, just right? 
Uh, too big. <laughs> too big. <laughs> Simple too big. answer. Yeah. Uh, when talking to the landlords, they said, hey, you want to lease an acre? And I said, sure, I'll lease an acre. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I had, you know, I had in mind Jean Martin, who was farming on two acres. So I thought, oh, I'll start with half. That'll be manageable. Um, we started with one bed right here, then put another bed in next to that. And maybe a month later, had six beds in. And uh, you know, maybe a couple months later, had six more in. And we took a long time to fill up that acre. In fact, it took us two years to form beds, permanent beds in the whole acre. If I could go back again and do it, I'd probably start with a quarter acre. I mean, even now, looking around, you have beds sitting vacant, you have beds tarped. There's a lot of just even open space that you could squeeze more beds into if you wanted to. Totally. Why are you only farming the amount of land that you're farming now? Uh, purely so we can manage it. Um, number one, we, we, you know, we're trying to sell everything we grow. We don't want to over, overproduce. In fact, I would rather, at least at this stage, underproduce and make sure I'm going to sell everything than, you know, maybe... Uh, meet every sales channel that I could but have a bunch of excess to deal with um, so what we've done is any beds that aren't being used we've tarped and they're ready and waiting for us they're not growing weeds in the meantime which was a big issue in the first two years we had this half of the farm in beds the other half was in nothing but weeds we did not we literally did not even get to it for two years um, it was doing nothing but building up the weed seed bank which we're now slowly depleting <laughs> um, so we've got it down to what we can manage and as we need more room for crops we will open up some of those beds in fact these ones right here these eight were tarped until uh two or three weeks ago and um, we just opened them up because we needed the space you know when you talk about just enough that we can manage can you elaborate on manage what becomes tough when you expand in size, where does the management fall apart and where does management struggle when you open up more beds? Uh, primarily keeping on top of weeds and um, being forced to get crops out quickly so they don't grow, you know, the larger a crop grows, the harder it is to remove it. Because we, we don't have a flail mower like Jean Martin does. If we had a flail mower, that wouldn't be such an issue. But uh, keeping things cycling through beds quickly so we can pull the crop out right away, but uh, primarily weeds. It's you know, staying on top of weeds is the um, that's the big management issue for us. You know, I'm looking around at your beds now. They look really clean, really clean compared to a lot of beds that I've seen at other farms. What's your main strategy for weed control on the farm besides tarping? Well, for one thing, we use the the rotary, rotary power harrow which has tines going on a vertical axis instead of a horizontal. So we're not bringing up weed seed. When we form the pathways, we are going down and flipping that soil up, which does bring some weed seed up. And I've noticed the difference. When we flip soil from the pathways onto the beds, there seems to be higher weed pressure than if we just run the power harrow for a couple, a couple cycles through different crops. So that's one thing that's preventative. But uh, the main aggressive, uh, weed strategy that we have is simply hoeing on time and we've learned the hard way that if you get if you get them when they're half an inch tall it's kind of a pleasure to whip that hoe through them if you wait until they're six inches tall you can get them but it takes a lot longer and if you let them get to two three four five six feet it's just a headache you know people always want to know what type of tool are you using a hoe any specific one collinear regular hoe um, we have two different stirrup hoes. We have a seven inch wide one, which we use for the pathways. And we have a, I think it's a three and a half inch wide one, which we use in between crops that are closer together. Uh, we also have two collinear hoes. Once again, one with a six or seven inch blade and the other one with a three inch blade. And for the Salanova, which are close together, we'll use the smaller collinear hoe. For the head lettuces, which are further apart, we'll use the bigger one. Um, those, those four hoes really are the weeding implements we use. And what we've been doing with this plot that we just uncovered, we're committed never to let it go to weeds like we have other beds before. So we have to keep some of the crops under row cover, mainly to protect them from rabbits actually, and birds. Um, and when something's covered with row cover, it's very easy to forget about the weeds under there. <laughs> so we've committed to a week after a crop goes in, uncover it, it doesn't matter if the bed looks pretty good, we're gonna cultivate it anyways, get all those small weeds, and just set the weeds back to ground zero. A week later, we'll come through, cultivate one more time, and I'm hoping we'll be done. So consistently stay on top of it and just gradually see that pressure go down. That's, that's the plan, yeah.
seems to be working so far. Here's one of the key pieces of machinery on Max's farm. Not this, which keeps the kids busy. It's this one. It's the BCS tractor, which I'm sitting on. And there's actually a special implement, which Max really loves on here. This is the Power Hero. What the Power Hero does is it turns the soil in a certain way that it doesn't bring up weed seeds. It does it very differently than a tiller. A tiller is going to have this type of motion going, where a power harrow is more of a twisting motion like this. So this is just taking the surface dirt and stirring it around. Think of it kind of like a Cuisinart cake mixer. It's just spinning it around like that versus like a chopping action of a rototiller, which can take the soil from top, bring it down, and the bottom soil up, weed seeds with it. So for Max, one thing he's talked about here is one way he's helped control his weed pressure and make this work is with the power harrow, something he uses on all of his beds to prepare the seed bed. One other advantage of the power harrow besides not drawing up weed seeds is it gives you a great seed bed, a nice smooth seed bed for when you're direct seeding. You know, just off to your left here, there's a whole bed that's being tarped. This is one that is just sitting, I mean, stale seed bed effectively, like mm -hmm. letting any weeds burn off. Giving your farm production now, like do you foresee the need to have this into production anytime soon based on your demand? Um, it's hard to say because we, we still feel like we can do a lot more with the beds that we're growing in. And um, basically the lesson we've learned is don't be too eager to expand. Um, you know, being limited to a smaller space forces you to grow better in that space. And we know we have a lot of skill building to do in growing better, turning beds over faster, um, getting the crops to even grow to maturity faster so we can get more cycles in there. So we've committed to not uncovering beds until we feel like we've maxed out the space that we're using. But that being said, I mean, as soon as, as, soon as we're there, we'll uncover them and they sh they'll be weed free and ready to go. I do anticipate this winter um, uncovering probably half of these beds here, probably be 10 to 12 beds. Uh, we're gonna put in a lot of stuff in the next month, which as the cooler temperatures kick in, they'll grow slowly over the winter and we can be harvesting from them, you know, through January and February with, um, you know, for example, four beds of carrots. We'll just throw four beds of carrots in, whereas I might only do one or two uh, now. I'll just throw in four, let them grow slowly. And as long as we can keep them weeded, we should have a consistent carrot supply through February. Based on the production you have right now, you have, what, maybe a quarter acre in production if you looked at just bed space or less? Uh, a, a, little, a little more than a third. Uh, so we were at a quarter before we put in the far zucchini on that end. Then with the addition of those and these eight beds here, I believe that took us over a third. And of the product that you're growing here, what percentage of that's going to farmer's market versus into the web store? The majority of it goes to the farmer's market. Um, in, in California, you are, maybe this is true in other states too, I'm not sure, but in California, you can only sell crops that you grow at a farmer's market and it's very strictly regulated. So an inspector comes onto the farm, you know, writes down all the crops that they see out here and put on, puts it on a certificate and those are the only crops I can sell at the market. So the market gets first priority for my, for my product because I can't sell someone else's product there. I can sell other people's product in the web store. So if we have extra over and beyond what the market will sell for us, we'll sell it in the web store. But uh, if not, then it all goes to the farmer's market. Knowing that you have a full acre here if you wanted it, you're farming over a third of an acre of that one acre. How many different types of crops are you growing? This is one thing you see on a lot of farms. Some farms grow a whole bunch of crops. Some farms are pretty lean about what actually generates cash flow and makes sense for the space. What have you arrived at? Um, well, what we've done is we've went, we, we've gone from trying to grow a lot of different things. You know, I have seed in the tent for probably 40 or 50 different cultivars of different vegetables, and I'm getting rid of more than half of it. We've narrowed it down to 10 to 15 crops that seem to work really well for us. They sell well in our markets. We seem to be good enough at growing them, and, um, and you know, they grow well in our climate. Basically, those are, um, bagged greens. Bagged greens are, are essential to our markets. That's spinach, arugula, and salanova lettuce. Uh, head lettuce, and within the realm of head lettuce, we've narrowed it down to green butter and romaine. Uh, you know, we're not growing any other types of lettuce. Those are the ones that sell well for us. They're the ones that we love personally, so we have no problem eating through the excess. Um, we're doing some root crops. We're doing turnips, you know, baby Japanese turnips, radishes. 
but only interplanting radishes. We're not, give, do, we're not giving any bed to a radish. Radishes go in wherever there's a little extra space. Um, we're still trying to do carrots. We haven't been real successful with carrots so far, but um, we're, we're trying to get better at that because they just they sell so well. Uh, green onions are a fast crop that's very high profit and very popular, so we're doing a lot of those. And then we're doing some summer stuff too, zucchini, eggplant, tomatoes. Tomatoes we're kind of on the fence on. We might not do those next season just because there's so much competition in the market. Uh, you know, there are people selling pint baskets of cherry tomatoes for $3 or less in the market when we really have to charge 4 for ours. So we sell very few of them and they're a lot of labor and we can buy them in very easily for the web store. So we're thinking to let other people grow tomatoes. Um, we're, you know, we're, tri we're trialing some flowers, some sunflowers especially, to, to see how they grow and how they sell. But um, that pretty much covers it. Here's one of the other tools on Max's farm that he really loves. This is a six row pinpoint cedar. This is something that Max uses predominantly for arugula. Now some farmers love this tool, some farmers hate this tool. And one thought that Max had on it, why he's got it to work so well, why he likes it is when he started farming, he just had this in the earthway. So he spent the time making this tool work in his conditions. I think that's my general takeaway when it comes to any type of cedar. They're all going to function differently in different soils, in different soil conditions, with different seeds. The key to making the tool work well is one, have a quality tool itself, but to it, your knowledge, understanding of using that tool in a given set of circumstances and in a given set of conditions. You can take the best tool in the world, give it to a newbie, and they're gonna hate it, it's not gonna work well. And you can take a bad tool, give it to a good market gardener, and they can probably spend enough time with it to get it figured out so they can make it work well. So don't just think of the tool itself as the time saver. It's gonna be the tool plus your knowledge of how to use it in those conditions, which is really gonna save you. So. If you invest in a tool like this, take the time to play around with it and figure out how to use it well. You have a lot of experience selling vegetables in two different business models, a farmer's market where you're growing your own product and an aggregator model where you're commingling some of your own product with other people's. If you look at just the farmer's market and growing your own vegetables, one thing that tends to come up a lot is, you know, you can make X dollars per acre where do you feel like profitability comes in? If you're selling a dollar worth of veg, how much of that do you think you're taking home at the end of the day is profit? Uh, in the selling through the store or selling at the farmer's market? At the farmer's market based on what you grow here, not aggregating. Well, a lot of it depends on scale. Uh, you know, we have a lot invested in this farm and as we grow, we'll be making more out of a dollar than we are now. Um, I mean, I'd say now, if I were to be honest about all the expenses and all the infrastructure that's gone into the farm, I'd probably make a pretty similar margin at the farmer's market and at the web store, which is around 30 to 40 percent. And at this scale, you work here, your wife works here, you also have a helper here. What type of hours go into managing the land you have under production right now? Our recent trend towards simplification has really reduced the number of hours we worked and just the fact that all the permanent beds are now cut that has greatly reduced the hours that we spend here. Um, and we've even gotten smarter with the web store. We used to have, Tuesday used to be a uh, 15, 16 hour day, you know, starting you know, on the computer before the sun's up to you know, packing well into the evening with lights. Um, so we don't do that anymore. Um, I'm pretty much home and done working by six every day, you know, maybe seven on some days. Uh, I, you know, I, I try to I try to get going by seven. Sometimes dear to needs help with the kids, and I have a soft heart and I stick around. Okay. <laughs> this is maybe a 50-hour week for you. Would you um, say? I'd say a 50-hour week is probably fair to say right now, yeah. if, if you include the weekend work. Um, and that's web store and farm. That's web store and farm. Yeah. So the web store is probably now that I'm not doing delivery driving, probably about a day and a half of work total. Um, and you know the farm really. At the scale we have, and with the systems we've built thus far, it doesn't take a ton of work. If you stay on top of weeding, um, you know, we use the greens harvester for harvesting greens, so it's super efficient for the bulk arugula that we do. Um, it, really, it really does not take a whole lot of time at the scale we're, we're, we're doing. 
if we scale up to the whole acre and we keep the workforce we have, we will obviously be putting in more hours. And, and we need to do that because right now we're supporting ourselves on multiple legs. The farm brings in some money, the store brings in some money, the microgreens bring in some money, and, and deer to, you know, teaches on the side part time. And it takes all of that together to pay the bills for us. We would love to see, you know, we'd love to see the farm by itself pay our bills and be able to hire maybe a manager for the store, pay him a salary, and get some cream off the top of that as well. One thing that I like that Max has mentioned quite a bit since I've been here hanging out with him for the day is he has tried to systematize everything on the farm. He basically looked at it like this. If I can't teach somebody to do it, I'm going to change the way I do it so I can. That means there's procedures for everything, everything is as simple as it needs to be, redundancies are eliminated, and everything is very clear and stated. There's no room for interpretation, there's no gray area. Because ultimately what Max would like to do someday is potentially be able to walk away from this farm and start another one. And the only way you can do that if you're hiring a farm manager is have processes that are easy to communicate. A lot of times as owners of businesses we do stuff our own way it's kind of janky it might make sense to us you try and relay that to someone and they're like what so what you need to do is try and remove that problem and it also helps you in the process it just makes things simpler reduce redundancy make it as simple as possible so just ask yourself could I teach somebody to do this reliably just as good as I could every single time or is there too much room for interpretation in there you know one thing you've grown a lot in the past very successfully is microgreens that's worked but right now you more or less have it scaled back or shut down is that just along the idea of a lot of what i'm hearing you know we have our hands full with other stuff that system needs some refinement some work so we're just going to back it down versus like trying to push that uphill we've been focusing a lot more on the market garden lately um the market garden up until now has always taken last priority uh, just because you know the money was in the microgreens and in the web store and we have the microgreens now down to a cycle where we get sunflower every week and we get broccoli and or radish every week and we put that through the farmers market and um, you know that's a good baseline income coming in for us we have a lot more revenue potential there to tap into uh, which is why we're, we're we're completely redoing the greenhouse. We're going to put in a heater this winter, so we can grow you know, successfully through the winter. It's been very patchy in the past. Uh, we've got the swamp cooler now for the summer, and what we're doing in the greenhouse is we're actually going to put protected beds in there for growing field microgreens, but in the green, in the protected culture of the greenhouse, because doing it in the field, we were getting too many critters in there and actually losing entire batches of microgreens, which we were counting on for the week's harvest. Um, so by moving into the greenhouse, you get the climate protection and the critter protection. Exactly. Honestly, we get protection from everything. I mean, wind, critters, insects, uh, excessive heat, excessive cold. We can control the light. You have the light just where you want it because actually, um, if you grow sunflower in full sun, they're a little more bitter than if they have the light reduced by you know 30 or 40 percent when it comes to having an off-grid farm sometimes you're just going to need power for certain things and here's one of the things that max needs power for his salad spinner this is a washing machine turned into a salad green spinner he's using that on the farm to dry greens because that's really the best way to do it if you're doing some sort of hand crank thing forget about it it's going to be a nightmare on a farm so this is going to save you a lot of time and labor the way he powers that right here off-grid one of these Honda generators and that's really what the generator goes to power should he pull his walk-in cooler in here which is on a trailer he could power the AC on that which keeps the trailer cool via that generator but the main thing for the generator is just general tools and the salad spinner here one way of making this off-grid farm function like a normal farm that would normally be tied into the grid. There you have it, Max Becker of First Steps Farm, just north of me here in California, up in Ojai. I hope you like this one. I hope you got a lot out of it. Max is doing a lot of unique things from his aggregator farm store model that he has, which I featured in a previous video, to the fact that he's farming off grid. You know, he's just showing that there's different ways to do something. It's not always the stereotypical way to farm. 
I love some of the lessons that Max shared in here about farm startup, some of the realities that he's faced. One that he mentioned that I've heard a lot of farmers mention is starting too big and then scaling back. Starting too big can happen in a few ways. It can be too much land, which means too much to manage, and it can also be too many crops and they're not all going to be equally profitable. Max has scaled back the land that he has into production and he also has scaled back the number of crops that he's producing. Both of those things make management easier and they make what he's actually doing more profitable. When you're a limited labor force like Max is on his farm, you have to make sure every action that you do pays and counts. So scale back and look at the 80-20 rule and apply your efforts and energies accordingly. More is not necessarily better and oftentimes when it comes to this style of veg on a small scale, less is actually better. If you want to learn more from Max and go more in depth with him, I've also done two separate podcast episodes with Max, one focusing on microgreens and field crops and one focusing on the farm store. I've linked to both of those below. If you want to learn more about Max's operations, he also does consulting. You can check out a link to that below. That's all for this one. Thanks for watching. Until next time, be nice, be thankful, and do the work.